Hello and good evening everyone. Thank you for joining us this Thursday evening, May 18th, 2017. Beautiful day. I hope everyone had a nice day. A little warm, but it's, you know, that time of year. We love it. Um, at least I do. So my name is Frank Bequickio and I'm a partner here at Russell Law Group and I'll be hosting tonight's webinar, which is entitled Keeping It Simple, Elder Law 101. But before I begin, I have to address a few administrative items. Excuse me, the presentation will last about an hour. And during that time, I'm sure or hope you'll have some questions. And if you do, there's a question pod on the right-hand side of your screen. You can put your questions in that pod, and uh, then I'll be able to get to them. Um, I'll try to address as many questions as I can as we go along, but I'll, I'll leave some time at the end as well for some Q&A. No question is unimportant, so we'll try to answer as many as you can, as we can, excuse me. Um, please also note that we'll be discussing financial and legal matters, and this program is not meant to be a substitute for obtaining professional financial and legal counsel. And at the end of the presentation, you're going to see my contact information, so please feel free to contact me after the webinar tonight if you want to um, ask me a question without offline, uh, certainly if you want to call any other questions you might have about tonight's topic or any other topic you feel might be able to help you with. And then lastly, you're going to see a survey pop up at the end of the presentation. We ask you to just take a minute or two to answer the survey questions. We use that feedback to develop and improve future webinars. So again, thank you for joining us tonight, keeping it simple, Elder Law 101, and let's get started. So um, this is anybody who's who's um, been to any of these webinars or seminars, this is something new. So that's me. Um, I'm Frank Paquicchio, and I'm a partner with Russo Law Group, and I focus my practice on the areas of estate planning, elder law, trust and estate administration, special needs planning, and a little bit of real estate. Uh, I'm a certified elder law attorney uh, through the National Academy of Elder Law, uh, excuse me, through the National Elder Law Foundation. Uh, and you can see I've got some other designations there. All right, so that's enough about that. Okay, so um, just kind of an overview. I always like to do this when I'm doing a presentation. Um, what we're going to cover tonight, this is um, the must-have legal documents, um, advanced directives, wills, and such. We're going to talk about planning for long-term care, and specifically the Medicaid uh, program, and then how to protect your residents and your life savings, um, potentially from a long-term care illness uh, and the cost of long-term care. So that's tonight's agenda, and um, hopefully you'll find this information tonight helpful, and uh, you'll have some good questions for me to answer. So the first um, part is the, the four must-haves, and um, uh, I'll say three and an optional. Um, I, the living will is, is may not fall into the category of must-have, but it's because that's kind of it depends how you feel. Um, so we have the durable power of attorney. Um, that, of course, is for financial matters, and you're naming an agent uh, under the power of attorney to handle your finances, um, typically in case something happens to you illness-wise or incapacity-wise. Um, not if you pass away. The power of attorney and the health care directives are um, living documents. They're only, they're only valid while you're alive, and when you pass away, those documents are no good anymore. So the power of attorney is for financial matters. And then the healthcare directives, which are a healthcare proxy, a living will, and the medical authorization. So the healthcare proxy is where you name someone to make healthcare decisions for you if you can't. Um, and you can have a successor agent, and should, should have a successor agent, at least one, in fact, if not more, um, if you can. Um, the healthcare proxy is very generally written, and it basically says if you can't make your own health decision, here's the person that can do it for you. And it pretty much covers any healthcare decision making including end-of-life decision-making. Um, and that's also where the living will comes in. So the living will um, is a separate document, and it's where you can outline your wishes. It doesn't name anybody typically. It's where you would outline your wishes in terms of um, end-of-life treatment or care if you were in a terminal, irreversible situation. Um, I often get asked, what's the difference, or why can't they be combined, or isn't living will part of the healthcare proxy? Um, and this, to me, is more of a, a, you know, potentially a style issue. I don't know if so that's a legal issue, and I sometimes joke about it being a little bit of paranoia on my part. Um, I prefer them to be two separate documents. I think the healthcare proxy should be um, general in, in that it just names who the decision maker is. It doesn't necessarily get into end of life situations. Um, that decision should be left up to the healthcare agent, in my mind. And then the living will is a separate document. And the reason I say it that way is because the healthcare proxy is the document that is should be shared 
with everyone involved. So it should be shared with your agents that you name. It should be shared with your doctors. If you go to the hospital, if you go to a rehab or a nursing home, the healthcare proxy should be given to everybody because it says who is the decision maker if something happens to you. The living will, which is the one that says pull the plug, so to speak, um, which you know you don't want artificial nutrition, hydration, and, and the like, um, keeping you alive if there's no hope that you're going to get better. To me, that's something that is just kept with your family or your healthcare agents. I don't think that that's something that I would give out until it became that situation. Um, and then the medic medical authorization, the um, sometimes referred to as the HIPAA authorization, you may have heard that term from your doctor. Um, that's where you can name somebody. Typically, it's the healthcare agent, uh, but it can be somebody else um, to obtain medical information for you. And then the last will testament or your living trust um, is part of the the second part of the plan. Um, obviously, a will exp um, you're setting forth who's going to handle your estate and who's going to inherit your estate when you pass away. And then the living trust, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight as well, um, does the same thing when you pass away, but it also acts as a living document, so it says what happens to the assets that are in the trust while you're alive, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more revocable, irrevocable, and how all of that um, may tie into your plan. Okay, so we talked about um, the must-have documents. I also said let's talk about some long-term care um, and Medicaid we'll get into, so just some, uh, some long-term care facts we thought we might throw out there. <clears throat> First of all, who's paying for it? Um, from a long-term care standpoint. Medicare is not meant to, and never was meant to be, um, a cover of long-term care. Medicare is short-term, it's hospitalization, it's rehab, um, it, and, and maybe a little bit of care at home. Uh, and anybody who's been through this, <clears throat> excuse me, with Medicare, um, usually after hospitalization, you come home, you need some help with PT or OT or nurse to administer some medicines or treatments, uh, that's a temporary thing. It's, it's a couple days, usually a couple days a week for a couple weeks, and then that's it. Um, but it's not long-term. Long-term care insurance, of course, by definition, is for long-term care. Um, and we're big proponents of long-term care insurance in the right situation, but not everybody um, is insurable and not everyone can afford it. But for those who can and are, it's something possibly to look at. Um, and long-term care insurance, um, depending on the policy, and there are lots of different types of policy, can either provide payment, um, directly to you, it can provide payment directly to a provider, usually there's a pool of money that you would have available. You can pay for your care out of your own um, pocket, so that's another way to pay for care, um, generally because this, the cost of care can be so extensive, um, you know, it could easily cost sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year uh, in care at home. If you're in a nursing home, probably looking at more like $170,000, $80,000 a year. Uh, which is a lot of money, and um, that most people would be wiped out fairly quickly. Um, you can have other family, children, or other members um, pay for your care. That doesn't happen very often, but it can. Um, so if you've got you know, family that can help chip in, um, that's an option. And, of course, the government, which is the Medicaid program, which is really what we're going to talk about tonight. <clears throat> so the Medicaid program um, is a long-term program. Um, it's it's meant to uh, pay for long-term care at home uh, or in a nursing home and in a, you know a handful of situations uh, of assisted living but it's a way of accessing um, high quality care without being financially devastated of course if you've done some planning so um, that's the long-term care insurance and uh, if not the insurance then typically it would be Medicaid rarely occasionally it's it's a combination of the two um, so for Medicaid, as I mentioned, there's care at home and there's nursing home. Um, one big important um, takeaway is that for Medicaid home care, or sometimes referred to as community Medicaid, there is no look back. So the five-year rule, the five-year look back that you probably have heard of, um, or if not will at some point, is only referring to nursing home care, not community-based care or home care. There is no look back. Now you may hear Somebody may tell you there's a three-month look back. That's not necessarily true, um, but Medicaid does typically ask for the last three months, and the reason there primarily is because there's the possibility of retroactive coverage from the three months prior to when you file the application, um, whether you're looking for it or not. So uh, we'll get into this a little bit more, but um, I just want uh, it's important to know that for home care, there's no look back, and for no center home care, there is. And we'll talk about some of the, you know, exceptions to some of these things as we go along tonight. 
Okay, so let's talk first about home care, um, the Medicaid home care program or community Medicaid. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is for, for those who are, uh, I, I was going to say want to stay at home, but I, I don't know that there are many people that don't want to stay home. Uh, so this is for people who want to stay home and can stay home but need help at, in their home. Um, the way they would qualify for Medicaid on the asset side is they need to have less than $14,850 to their name uh, with a couple of exceptions. For example, uh, your home is exempt. If you own your home, your home is exempt as long as you live there. So obviously if the person is living at home and getting help at home, their home doesn't count towards Medicaid eligibility because they're living there. Um, and then there are special rules for retirement accounts, which we'll talk about. And as I said, there's no transfer, uh, well, there's no look back, and because there's no look back, there is no transfer penalty rule. So if somebody has more than $14,000 in the assets, they can actually um, transfer it out of their name the month before applying for Medicaid at home, and there's no penalty associated with that transfer. So it's very important to know. A lot of people think that they have to wait. I actually had a client think that thought they had to wait five years to get the care at home, and they didn't have to. Um, so that's the asset side. On the income side, uh, Medicaid has rules as well, and your uh, general rule is for, well, for this single person, not general rule, the rule is the person is allowed to keep $845 a month of income. Uh, so what is income? It's your Social Security, it's a pension if you get a pension, it could be a re retirement account distribution. Uh, whatever that adds up to, you're allowed to keep 845 bucks. That's not very much, and I think that most people, um, at least on Long Island, um, would have a difficult time getting by on only $845. So the way that we can help protect that extra income, if there is, and the person needs it, is through the pooled income trust. Uh, and that's what you see there on your screen, protect your income. The Teresa Pooled Trust is um, happens to be uh, our favorite trust, um, but there are 22, including the Teresa Pool Trust out there, um, and this is all information that's available on the web. Um, but I'm going to talk primarily about the Teresa Trust because it's the one I'm most familiar and comfortable with. So um, if, let's say, for example, a client has $1,800 a month of income, well, let's use 1845 because they're allowed to keep 845 So I have $1,000 too much but they need that $1,000 to help pay their bills. So they can take the $1,000 and put it into a pooled income trust like the Teresa Pool Trust, and then, and this is okay with Medicaid, and then the pool trust can use that $1,000 to help pay for the person's living expenses. So now they get to keep the $845 to pay their bills, and they're still getting to use the other 1000 to pay their bills less the monthly charge that the trustee charges to do this. It is typically what I'll call a nominal charge, um, the, and the charge is based upon the amount of money going into the pooled trust, but weighed against the alternative, which is paying the $1,000 over to the agency or to Medicaid, it's a kind of a no-brainer if you need the money. Even if it costs $100 in my example, which it wouldn't, I think, I think $1,000, the fee would probably be in the neighborhood of about $70 or $80, but let's say it's 100 bucks. If you're putting in $1,000 into the pool trust and the trustee is going to take $100 as their fee to manage that money and, and pay your bills, you still have $900 available to pay your bills. And the other alternative where you're turning that $1,000 over to Medicaid, for example, you only have the $800, you are losing $1,000 as opposed to losing $100. So for somebody who is able to stay home, <clears throat> excuse me, needs help at home and has too much income for Medicaid purposes, this is a wonderful way to preserve that income and be able to keep them home longer. All right, so um, I covered a lot there. So again, I'm just going to remind you at this point, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in in the uh, question pod, which is located, again, on the, the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and I'll check there periodically um, to see if anybody has any questions, okay? <clears throat> All right, so how do you protect your, um, your residence? Let me just make sure. Oops. Up here. Okay. Um, how do you protect your residence? There are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, we always first look for what are called exempt transfers, and that this is true of liquid assets too, which we'll get to in a little bit. An exempt transfer is a transfer of an asset such as your home that has no effect on Medicaid eligibility, um, because we're now we're gonna we're gonna move into um, 
you know, nursing home uh, Medicaid, um, and with the five year look back and penalties, and that's where this this these exempt transfers become very important. Um, so one way to protect your home is is an exempt transfer, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, the other would be to transfer it out of your name, or the person who is is looking to protect their residence out of their name um, to someone else. Typically, it would be the children. Um, and retaining what's called a life estate. That's the second option you see on the screen. Um, that has what I'll call limited uh, value. There are a handful of cir circumstances where that's a, a good way to do it, but generally speaking, that's not a better way, not a, a, a good way to do it. Um, typically, the way to protect the asset, excuse me, protect the residents, if we're talking about advanced planning, almost always the best route is going to be to put the home into a, what we call a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail in, in a few minutes as well. <clears throat> so let's talk about, I mentioned the exempt transfers. So these are transfers that have no impact on Medicaid eligibility, all right? So we're talking now about potentially nursing home because remember, for community Medicaid, there is no look back, therefore there is no penalty for giving assets away. If somebody was to go into a nursing home, and apply for Medicaid. Medicaid is going to go back five years and they want to see what you've been doing basically with your money and are you looking to hide it in essence by getting rid of it during that time. So the general rule is if, you're do, if you've done something like that in the five year period, for example, if you put your home into your children's names within the last five years and you go into a nursing home, Medicaid is going to look back and they're going to penalize you for that subject to these exceptions. So the first one is spouse to spouse. There's no waiting period. There's no penalty when the, uh, when the residence is transferred between spouses. It's an exempt transfer. The second is if you have a child who has disabilities, who's disabled. Now, this one you have to be careful with because there are two types of situations. One of them is a child who's on Social Security disability, and the other one is a child who is on Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. SSI has more strict rules than Medicaid does. So putting the house into a child's name who's on SSI, it might be an exempt transfer for you, but it's going to affect potentially their SSI. They may lose their SSI in Medicaid. So you have to be careful with that. We'd have to talk about setting up a trust. But if you have a child who's on Social Security Disability, and I just had a, I met with a family, um, geez, I think it was this morning, maybe even yesterday morning, and we were talking about the, their mom and she is in rehabilitation and um, likely is going to need to stay in the nursing home. She has a home, and um, it's, it's not terribly valuable, but it, it's got some, some value to it, equity. And one of her daughters is on Social Security Disability, and I explained that by putting the house into that daughter's name, it will be protected automatically, and we won't have to worry about penalties and things like that. So, uh, and it won't affect her disability. So that's another option, and it's good to know. The caregiver child exception uh, exemption, excuse me, um, basically is you have to have a child who's lived with you for two year, at least two years, um, but that two years is immediately prior to the client needing nursing home care. So if you have a child who's lived with you for at least two years and has helped take care of you during those two years, and that part is generally assumed, then Medicaid will let you take the house and put it into that child's name as an exempt transfer. All right, but it has to be immediately prior to, to nursing home. So if, you, if your kid has lived with you for 40 years and moves out, we no longer have this exception. And then the last one is kind of um, a unique one. It doesn't happen very often, but if you own your home and you have a sibling, uh, a sibling who owns it with you, has an equity interest, um, and at least for, lived together for a year, you can transfer it to that sibling. Um, that happens occasionally in you know, like old, old school Brooklyn where the families were living in the same house. Um, okay, so. We mentioned the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about how that works because, as I said before, if you're looking to protect your home, uh, and then we're talking about advanced planning here. This is not crisis planning. We'll get to that in a little bit. This is advanced planning. So if you're looking to um, protect your home in advance and um, are looking to get the house out of your name, which is the way to protect it, almost always this is going to be the way to go. So the first thing is you retain the right to live there. All right, which is similar to a life state. You, you put your home into a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. In the trust, it's going to say that you have the right to live there. You and your spouse, if you're married, have the right to live there for the rest of your lives. With that right, though, comes the responsibility of still maintaining the house. So you still have to pay the taxes. 
You still have to uh, keep it insured. You have to take care of it. Because you have to do all of those things, you get to keep your real estate tax exemption. So if you have a star exemption, the veterans exemption, it all stays intact. When you have a trust, you have to have a trustee or trustees, could be more than one, um, and then there are beneficiaries. So with the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, you get to choose who the trustee is. It can't be you, it can be anybody but you, um, but you get to choose who the trustee is, but you also get the power to change the trustee, all right? Because the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust is, a, is an irrevocable trust, but the couple of powers that you retain are the right to fire and replace the trustee at will, and the right to change the beneficiaries if you needed to or wanted to. So it's nice to know, to me, that you have, you know, you've got some control there, right? All right, so that's the trustee beneficiary. It preserves your capital gains tax exemption, all right? So as, um, as owners of the home, um, of a home, excuse me, each owner gets up to a $250,000, uh, what's called exclusion from gain, uh, from taxable gain. If you transfer your home to the trust, you get to keep those exemptions. If you transfer it to your children, the children don't get the benefit of those exemptions. And if it's sold during your lifetime, there are capital gains tax issues. We don't have that problem with the trust. It also protects the home from family issues. So again, putting the home into the kids' names or the life estate, which I said before is an option, but generally not a very good one. Um, I've had more than, more than a handful of times where that's been a problem. Um, and in fact, it just came up the other day where um, I met with a woman who put her home into her two children's names back in 2012. She now just wants to get rid of the house and her relationship with her daughter is pretty much non-existent, unfortunately. And her daughter is not gonna agree to any sale and the mom is stuck. Um, if the house was in the trust, she wouldn't have that problem, all right? So problem solved there. The trust avoids probate, that's a bonus, that's not typically why you would set up a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Um, and then the proceeds of the house are protect, of the sale of the house are protected if it's sold uh, during your lifetime because the proceeds stay in the trust. All right, so the, it works great. The Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, if you're looking to protect your home, and you can also put liquid assets, we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but we're talking about the house at the moment, it works wonderfully and it doesn't really change anything because you're gonna live in the house and pay all the bills just like you're doing now, except the house would be protected after five years of having been put in the trust. All right, so liquid assets. Um, how do you protect your money? Well, as I just said, you can put assets, liquid assets into the uh, Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Um, we can do exempt transfers, so the, um, some of the transfers that related to the house that are also um, applicable for for liquid assets would be spouse to spouse. So basically what I'm saying is any asset can be transferred to a spouse without penalty, house or cash or liquid. Um, same with the disabled child, all right? So if you have a child who's on dis uh, social security disability, you can put the house in their name, you can put cash into their name and it's protected. <clears throat> um, the, the caregiver child, that only works with the house, not with the cash. Um, retirement accounts, are, are um, unique when it comes to Medicaid and um, planning. Typically, I wouldn't do any advanced planning with um, retirement accounts because the only way to protect money is to get it out of your name. And the only way to get retirement accounts out of your name is to first pull the money out of the retirement accounts. And as you probably all know, once you pull money out of a retirement account, you have to pay tax on it. So generally, we would deal with retirement accounts in the, uh, in the moment if somebody has an illness and needs to apply for Medicaid, and we would go over the different options about keeping it versus liquidating it versus pulling out a required minimum distribution and how all of those different options uh, would affect Medicaid eligibility. All right, let me check the, because uh, I see there's at least one question here on uh, Medicaid. Oops, it looks like, okay. <clears throat> So the question is, what about a married couple where one person needs Medicaid at home? Um, okay, so uh, if whoever, uh, if the asker wants to expand upon that a little bit, that'd be great, um, but I'll try and answer what I think you're asking. What about a married couple where one person needs Medicaid at home? Um, so what happens is the Medicaid has rules for both people, um, but the spouse who's not applying for Medicaid, which is true in nursing home as well, um, would typically sign it what's called a spousal refusal um, saying that they need their money for themselves and um, 
the person who is applying for Medicaid those rules that I threw out before about the monthly income and the assets, the, the $845 per month and the $14,000 in assets would apply. And you could still do the pool trust if need be for the, uh, for the married couple and the extra income, okay? All right, um, thank you for that question. Okay, so again, going back to life savings and living trusts, um, it's very important to know that revocable living trusts do not protect assets. Um, I've seen over the years um, more than I'd like to count uh, clients who have um, set up revocable living trusts thinking that their assets were being protected. Um, and that's, you know, obviously it's, it's upsetting when they learn that. A revocable trust, you have complete control over it. It's your money. It's in a trust, but it's still yours. You have free reign over the money. You're, you're usually a trustee uh, or if not the trustee and you have the right to go in and out of the trust and use the money for whatever you want. Therefore, it is not protected. If you have access to money and you need Medicaid, Medicaid is going to want you to spend your money first. Revocable trusts are typically set up to avoid probate, um, and they can avoid what's called a state Medicaid estate recovery if you are on Medicaid, and that's typically with the house. If you're living in your home, you can put it into a revocable trust, even though it's exempt. So if you're looking, again, to protect your money, and getting it out of your name, obviously, as I said before, is the way to protect it, then the way we're going to want to do that most likely is the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. So as I mentioned, it's irrevocable. The trust is irrevocable. That's how you get the protection. And we have this five-year wait. So it gets confusing sometimes between, you know, the I said five-year wait, but I thought it was a five-year look back. It's only a five-year look back when you're applying for Medicaid, right? So if somebody goes into a nursing home and applies for Medicaid, Medicaid is going to go back five years. But if we're talking about setting up a trust, a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, we're not in that mode, typically. We're in advanced planning mode, where we have somebody who's healthy or healthy enough and is living at home and is not in a nursing home, is not eminently going to a nursing home. So we have to think five years prospectively, right? So if the person sets up a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust and puts money into it or their home into it, they need to stay out of a nursing home for five years because of the five-year look back. Right? So if something happens within five years, Medicaid is going to go back and they're going to see it. If five years has passed, so it's six years now and the, the person needs to go into a nursing home, Medicaid is not going to see that transfer because it was done more than five years ago. And even if they do see it, there's nothing they can do about it because it's beyond the scope of their reach. All right? So we have this five-year wait. If you're setting up a trust like this, the idea is or the, the um, understanding is that you're going to need to stay out of a nursing home for at least five years. Um, the, the Asset Protection Trust can also um, allow income to be paid to you if there's income in the trust, but you just have to understand that if you're getting the income, then it obviously is unprotected. And then you've got some control over it, even though it's irrevocable, and those are the couple of things I mentioned before, which is the right to change the trustee and the right to change the beneficiaries. So even though the trust is technically irrevocable, you still have some control over the um, the inner workings of the trust by controlling who's managing the trust and by controlling ultimately who's going to benefit from the trust when you pass away. Um, so that usually works out pretty well. If nothing else, clients know that they've got that power, frankly, um, to make those changes, all right? <clears throat> okay, retirement accounts. So I mentioned I'd get into this a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to use the word, the term IRA, uh, just you should say it in retirement account. So I'm going to call it an IRA, but understand IRA, 401k, 403b, um, all fall into this general category of retirement account. So as I said, Medicaid has rules as to how much money you can have. That's called the resource um, level, and those are your assets, and that's 14850 subject to uh, those exceptions that I talked about before. And they have also um, rules as to how much income you can have per month and depending on if it's nursing home or home care, there are different levels of income. So what is an IRA? Is it an asset or is it income? Well, it's actually both, right? So if I have a $100,000 IRA, I can go tomorrow and take that money out if I wanted to. Now, depending on my age, there may be penalties associated with that, which is if you're under 59 and a half. And if I'm over 59 and a half, there's just going to be, there's going to be taxes involved, right? So if I have a let's say a 75-year-old that has a $100,000 IRA, 
and that person now needs to apply for Medicaid, either at home or nursing home, um, and let's say it's a single person, just to keep the example simple for the moment, that person, we have to make a decision. Is it possible for that client to have $10,000 in the bank and have a $100,000 IRA and be eligible for Medicaid? The answer is yes. All right. The way that happens is that when we apply for Medicaid, we're going to explain to Medicaid that they shouldn't look at that IRA as a $100,000 asset. They should count the distribution, the minimum distribution that's coming out, and it has to be done on a monthly basis because that's how Medicaid does their budget. Look at that monthly income distribution as part of my income budget, not as part of my asset. So depending on, again, if it's nursing home or home care, maybe it's going into the pool trust. If it's over the 845, it might be going to the nursing home. But we're allowed, he would be allowed to keep the IRA intact, 100000 and give up or withdraw, I should say, this, this monthly distribution and depending on their other income would determine what would happen to it. So that's option A. So it's possible to have $100,000 IRA and still be eligible for Medicaid. The other option is to treat it as an asset. Now, obviously, in that example, you can't say to Medicaid, well, I have this $100,000 IRA, um, and I, I don't want you to count my income. That, that means they're going to count the $100,000 IRA, which means you'd have to do something with the IRA, which means you'd have to pull it out, pay tax on it, and then do something with it. So I think the best example I can give you there, because that was probably pretty confusing and I apologize, is um, a client that I had a number of years ago, and I always use um, this couple as my uh, example when it comes to this. He had, uh, the husband that is, he was diagnosed with early um, dementia. He was diagnosed in his uh, mid-40s, actually, while he was working. And it progressed kind of slowly. He was able to work uh, a good 10 more years, but then it got to the point where he couldn't work anymore. Um, and when they, uh, when he was diagnosed, or shortly thereafter, they had come in because it, you know, it, it worried them. And we made sure we got all the, you know, all the documents in order. We got the power of attorney, the healthcare proxy, their wills, got all that in order, um, just in case. And uh, thankfully, we did. So, as as his disease got worse, he was unable to work at one point, um, and he was home, and uh, because he wasn't able to do his job anymore. And then um, ultimately, a few years after that, unfortunately, he ended up in a nursing home, and he was only in his early 60s at that point. Um, and when he came, when he went into the nursing home very, with very severe dementia at that point, I met again with his wife. And we had already, we, you know, when we saw this coming, we had already uh, moved the house and things into her name. But he had this one asset. He had a 401k from his job, and it had about $360,000 in it. So... All along, I had been telling her, you know, look, you know, you don't have to do anything. You can put, you can draw money out because he's over 59 and a half. If you need money, you can draw it out, use it to pay for things, you know, just pay income tax on it, um, which she did periodically as she needed it. Um, but now we're faced with this. He's in a nursing home, and he's got this big uh, 401K. So I laid out her two options. I said to her, you know, we can leave it alone. He'll have to pull out X amount. Um, I forget exactly how much it was, but in her situation, that money would have gone to the nursing home because she already had her own income, or she could liquidate it with her with his spouse attorney. She could liquidate it, pay tax, and then because it was spouse, the money, as I said before, money going between spouses is exempt. So I said to her, "Look, it's a lot of money. I would not make that decision without first speaking to my accountant because if I'm going to cash it in, not me. If she's going to cash it in." She needs to know. I, I'd want to know what kind of tax hit am I looking at, right? So she spoke to her accountant, and my recollection is that the accountant said she'd pay probably around fifty thousand dollars in tax. So she'd net around three hundred and ten, a little less. Um, and because the of the exempt transfer rule, she would be able to take that three hundred ten thousand dollars, put it into her name, and it was hers, and she would move on with her life. So it's difficult when you're in this situation because it's it's kind of a bet to die bet to live decision right if you go the the route where I'll pull out in her in his case I'll pull out how much I have to pull out every month as per Medicaid and IRS rules and that money will go to the nursing home if he lives too long because he was physically very healthy if he lives too long that that account is just kind of slowly bleeding out so at some point it's you know it's going to drain over time and at some point it could be gone um, the flip side of that is if she was to liquidate it, pay all of that tax, and put the money into her name, if he was to die shortly thereafter, she made a mistake now because she could have inherited that 401k, rolled it over, 
and, and pay tax over years, um, like you know we typically think of when we have a retirement account. So you kind of make those decisions with the information you have at the moment. So her decision was to liquidate it. She cashed it in. She paid the tax. She had a little over three hundred grand. She put it in the bank. We applied for Medicaid and got him on Medicaid. Um, so he passed about six years later, and um, I don't remember. I don't remember if I actually calculated it because there's a crossover point in terms of what you pay in tax versus how much would have been paid. Um, but it didn't matter. I mean, she made the decision. It's one of those decisions you have to make at the moment and just do the best you can and move on, and you can't regret. So. My point to that is that there are options when it comes to retirement accounts, and typically we don't do any kind of advanced planning with them. Uh, we deal with them as and when we have to. All right, so um, I would say uh, for anybody who's interested in protecting themselves and or their assets, um, that planning in advance is the key. So that's pr providing for ongoing decision making, so that's your powers of attorney, your healthcare proxies, uh, potentially living trust, and then you're planning for um, for potentially needing long-term care and how that gets paid for, and that, of course, is protecting your assets. Um, and if it's advanced planning, again, you're probably looking at um, setting up a, a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, at least for your home, if you've got a home, and maybe even a portion of your liquid assets. I generally, um, and it's, it's probably more strong than generally, um, because I don't think I've ever recommended that anybody put all of their money into a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. I had one client who wanted to, and I think I actually talked them out of it, um, because I don't think it's a good idea. Um, but it's, if you do have money, um, I was going to say extra money, uh, but if you've got money uh, in the bank, quote unquote, and um, you have more than you think you're going to need, depending on your income and, and your expenses and such, and that's part of the, I hope you do that process. Um, in terms of analysis, then you might want to put some of your liquid assets into the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust as well. Might as well get as much bang for your buck as you can. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so that's it in advance. What happens when you, there's a crisis? Um, so one of the most important takeaways, it is almost never too late to protect a portion of your assets. All right? I hear way too many times that um, if it wasn't done more than five years ago, it's too late. Um, I have met with so many clients over the years that have come in um, late, very late in the game um, and have spent a ton of money on care because they thought that that's the, that was their only option. Um, so I'm, I, the reason I like to, to tell people about this is so that even if it doesn't happen to you, if somebody says to you, well, I didn't, you know, it's, mom went into a nursing home and, oh, it's, what a shame, we didn't do it five years ago and she's got this money and it's going to be all gone. No, that's not the case. So how do we do this? So um, what we used to call rule of, and it's not really a rule, it was, it was generally referred to as rule of halves, uh, or, or some people called it half, half a loaf, um, the bread theory. Um, we now call part gift, part loan. So this is when we have a crisis situation. So somebody, is, a single person typically, is in a nursing home, we're going to a nursing home and has some amount of money, and now we're saying, all right, can we save some of this money for the family, most likely, right? So this is where we have no exempt transfers available, um, because obviously if we have exempt transfers available, we, we can save all of the money or all of the asset. So, but we're now we're sitting with um, somebody who's got some money. Let's make up a number. There's $300,000, and they're in a nursing home, and it, the children come to me, and they say, Frank, what can we do? Well, here's the, this is going to be the plan. It's going to be part gift, part loan. First of all, we have to calculate if there are any, um, any allowances, exemptions, and prepayments. So this person's got $300,000. So we take off the $14,000 that the person's allowed to keep. We're allowed to prepay funeral expenses, and they can prepay legal fees, right? So let's say that's thirty grand all told. So what did I say? three hundred. So we're down to two hundred and seventy. Let's say... 260 because it's easier to divide by two. So there's $260,000 there. What our job is is to calculate how much we're going to the client is going to gift of that 270 or 60,000 dollars whatever's left. That gift is going to create a Medicaid penalty period based upon the amount of the gift, and that period is a period of months. So in other words, if I was to, if that client was to give away $140,000, let's say, that $140,000 gift create, and then we go and apply for Medicaid, and Medicaid sees the, 
this gift, Medicaid is going to penalize that person by not paying for an amount of time that that $140,000 would have covered if they kept the money. So that's going to be about 12 months, 13 months or so. So let's say it's 12 months. So the person gives away this chunk of money and it creates this penalty of one year. Well, the other half of the money, in my example, is going to be loaned to a, excuse me, a trusted family member, and we structure a loan, a, a promissory note payment with interest, it's all legitimate, of course, to cover that penalty period over that period of time. So we are giving a part of the money away that's creating a, a penalty, that's the money we're trying to protect, and then we're loaning part of the money away, and that money is going to be used to pay the nursing home during the penalty that we created with the gift. So the general rule of thumb is about 40, 40%, 45% of the assets can be protected in this scenario. Sometimes it's more, all right? It's, there, are, there are a bunch of factors, the, the person's monthly income, the cost of the nursing home, is there any Medicare coverage? All of these are factors in terms of how much we can protect, but my point of all of this is that nobody should ever lose everything if they don't want to, all right? I'm not saying certainly, well, this could, well, I, I, I'm not to say, all right? My job is to advise, not to decide. So the plan could be, well, I know Frank could save 40 to 45 percent. That's good enough. I'm going to keep all my money for myself, and if something happens to me, I know that my kids will lose 50, 60 percent. That's fine. It's your money. Um, if you want to do better than that, and you're not you're not ill now, then we can talk about maybe setting setting up a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust and getting some of that money out of your name into the trust or the house, or because the house could be part of this example as well in terms of the money, um, and getting some of that money protected now to limit your exposure, right? So it works great. Um, it's, you know, it's a complicated plan. It's a lot of work, but I don't want anybody to, to lose all of their money unnecessarily um, just because they didn't know any better. All right, I'm going to check out a few more slides or just a little question and answer break. Uh, all right, we're good. Nothing. I don't think anyway. It doesn't look like it. Okay, so I'm going to keep going, but if you have a question, um, keep a, type, type them in there, or um, we'll uh, we'll save a little bit of time again at the end. How are we doing? 7:44. So we're okay. Um, all right. So we call it a peace of mind action plan. Um, first is to retain the services of an experienced attorney, obviously, um, who cares about you and your family. And I think experience in this area is important because um, I don't think you want somebody who dabbles in this area. I think you want somebody who's up to it in their necks, uh, kind of like us. And then se second step, of course, is to implement a plan if you don't have one or update it, right? When do you update your plan? Well, if you do a power of attorney, if you do a will, they are likely going to be drafted in a way that would last your lifetime. Um, but things change. Laws change. So it's a good idea to periodically review what you got and make any tweaks or even redos if need be, right? So just because you've done something, if, you don't, if your plan is more than, well, it's going to depend on your age too, but if your plan is more than, you know, five or seven or eight years old, uh, might be a good idea to get it reviewed, and we're happy to help with that. Um, and certainly if anything changes in the family, financially, health-wise, um, again, a good good idea to review your, your planning at that point as well. Um, so... Again, of course, we're happy to meet with you. We're happy to help. Um, we've got information on our website, which you see there, uh, which we're very proud of our website. Got a lot of compliments on it. Um, in fact, I got a couple just recently when I was on the when I went on it with a couple of clients to show them around. Um, so check that out, and um, you can get our eblast, enroll in our eblast there as well uh, on the website. Um, and we're always doing seminars, webinars. That's on the website as well. And as I said before, there's the contact information. We have an 800 number. Um, that's our general email address. You can email me directly through the website as well. Um, or you can just, my email is frank at vjrussellaw.com. So you can email me uh, or just call me in the office and uh, be happy to talk. Or uh, if we need to meet, we can meet. It would be great. Um, all our firm practices in um, what we're what's referred to sometimes as a boutique law firm, which means that we're, we're, limited in terms of um, the areas of practice that we do. Uh, I should say concentrated is probably a better word because limited is negative, it sounds like. So we concentrate only in these areas that you see here. Um, we don't dabble in other areas. So um, estate planning, uh, healthcare decision making, which we talked about before, which is healthcare proxies, HIPAA designations, um, powers of attorney, 
guardianships where people don't have advanced directives like powers of attorney, health care proxy, um, wills, trusts, and uh, probate estate administration as well. All right, so I'm going to give it one last call out for uh, questions. Um, but I want to, in the meantime, thank everyone for participating in the webinar tonight. Again, if you have any additional questions, you can email them to the uh, info at vjrusolaw.com email, or of course you can email me directly, as I mentioned before. We have some great um, seminars and webinars coming up. You can get those off our website, as I mentioned. And just as a reminder, please take a minute to fill out the survey that's going to pop up when we're done, um, and we appreciate your feedback. Thank you all again. Have a great evening and a wonderful weekend, and let's hope the weather um, stays beautiful. Thanks again, everyone. Good night.